Hello, everyone. Thank you again for joining us. My name is Kelly Robert, and I'm part of the marketing department at UBT. I'm the journey program manager. And I, I would like to give a great big shout out to Caitlin Moore, one of my colleagues, with Caitlin that you, you just heard from, for doing all of our technical stuff. Caitlin is the financial literacy manager, and she this is definitely in her wheelhouse. I'd also like to thank Nikki Davison, who has helped me. Again, Nikki, I was thanking you for your help in putting this series together. You know, in coordinating this series, we were trying to come up with things that either as you're working from home or if you're home waiting for the world to open back up, as it were, things that you might be doing. You know, you're drinking lots of coffee, you're having to make your own coffee because many of us aren't aren't heading to the mill. Um, I know I really miss being able to walk down there from my office. And so this was our very first segment, was how to make a really great cup of coffee. Ken Cavanaugh, who has been with the mill a very long time and really knows his stuff, has um, graciously agreed to present today. So I, I just thank him for being here. And without any further ado, please take it away, Ken. Oh, thanks, Kelly. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you guys for being here. Um, apologies for the uh, lack of visuals. I have some pictures that I was going to use. We may yet figure it out, but um, I'm thinking maybe uh, depending on how you all want to do this, uh, I have essentially uh, what I use when I do training, coffee training with new hires at the mill. Um, it's probably a little more than we want to get into today. It's, uh, it doesn't have to be a lecture here. I, I like a discussion just as well or better. So. Uh, questions are welcome if we can figure out how to do that. I'm not sure if the chat thing is how, we'll, how we do that or, or if they'll uh, just be submitted some other way. But if there's questions, that's great. Otherwise, I'll just do a whole lot of talking. Um, so yeah, I've been with the mill for, this is my, I think I've gotten it wrong recently because it's been so long, uh, 26th year at the mill. Um, started there as a barista when I was in college and uh, started managing, uh, essentially acted as a general manager for a number of years. Uh, and then I took over the roasting duties for one of the owners was our roaster at the time. He taught me how to roast coffee. And so that's been my primary job for the last 10 years or so. Um, but I also do training, um, do things like this. Um, and currently or recently I've managed our kitchen at the mill. Um, I'm also a food guy, so that's fun. Um, but I just stopped doing that. And, I'm back to more kind of a GM role with the mill. So, but roasting is my primary responsibility. Um, so hopefully I've learned a little bit over the years that I can share with you all. Um, and I thought first what I'd do, again, we won't want to get into too much of the detail of the science necessarily or of coffee, but talk about what specialty coffee means. Um, you guys may have heard that term. What is specialty coffee? Um, and let me take a step back, really, when we talk about the, the title of this uh, today. Um, one of the first things I do with new hires or anyone that I'm talking to coffee about is, is I say often that taste is subjective um, or relative, right? So the best cup of coffee really is what you like the best. So, you know, you might come and ask me what, what my favorite coffee is, and I give you a sample of that, and you take it home, and you think I'm an idiot because you don't like it. So... That's where the taste being subjective comes in. So the main thing that we recommend at the mill for people to do is to explore. That's the fun part. So, um, but specialty coffee, um, there is a specialty coffee association. Um, it used to be until recently, it was of America and of Europe. Um, and they've recently uh, unified into one association and they have established uh, standards for what makes specialty coffee. So how is specialty coffee different from your average, uh, no offense to grocery store coffee, there's nothing wrong with grocery store coffee. In fact, it's a lot better than it was even 10 years ago. Uh, but specialty coffee, the Specialty Coffee Association has established these standards and um, there are standards that uh, occur at the farm uh, where the coffee's grown, um, in the supply chain, um, then in roasting, and then uh, at the point of brewing, so whether it's baristas at the mill or you at home, those are the four places where uh, things can happen that degrade coffee or things go wrong. 
to it so that it's not as good as it could have been. Um, so specialty coffee uh, standards basically are um, enforced. They're, they're in place now at farms and in the supply chain. They're very specific how coffee has to be grown, um, the conditions that, it, that it's uh, presented in the supply chain, how it has to be treated. All of those things are carefully monitored. The standards on the roasting and on the brewing part are still a work in progress. And because a big part of that is because different roasters have different opinions about how coffees, particular coffee should be roasted. Um, so that's kind of a little more fluid, but that's what makes specialty coffee, uh, specialty coffee. Uh, when you hear that, it's not just a way of saying our coffee is better than the others, because really coffee across the board, like I said today, the quality is much higher than it was even 10 years ago. Um, there's really, it's easy to get a great cup of coffee, much easier than it used to be. So, um, but that's especially coffee. When you hear that, there are actually standards there that are present that make it what it is, the quality level. Um, I mentioned taste is subjective. So the first thing that I would do if someone comes uh, into the mill and they're just getting into coffee, they want to explore it, uh, or maybe they just, they've been drinking it for a long time, but they want to really get into it. Um, we always recommend that they, they sample one coffee from each of the three growing regions in the world. Um, so those three growing regions are also uh, defined by the Specialty Coffee Association, and they are Latin America, uh, Africa, and then, and then we say Indonesia and Pacific Islands. And we say and Pacific Islands because that includes Hawaii. Um, obviously that's not Indonesia, but those are the three growing regions. Um, so Latin America, you're talking about your Colombia, your Guatemala, Costa Rica, those, those countries. Um, and those coffees tend to be crowd pleasers, we say. They're usually easy to drink, um, nothing real exotic or unusual that's gonna put people off. Um, and that's also the region that we got most of our coffee here in the US for a long time because it was closest. So that's kind of what the American palate is used to, those Colombians, the Guatemalans and such. Um, Africa. Uh, so your Ethiopia, Kenyan, Rwanda, all these African coffees, um, those coffees tend to be a lot more complex. They're higher uh, acidity coffees, which when we talk about acidity in coffee, that's a good thing. It makes the coffees bright and tangy. Um, so you hear a lot of comparisons with African coffees. Uh, you hear a lot of the same things you do with wine. So uh, fruity, uh, jammy, uh, floral um, that higher acidity also makes them tend to be drier. And you can actually, if you've ever had dry wine, obviously you feel that on your palate, right? You can, it's the same with coffee. Um, so that gives it more crispness uh, or clean finish, that kind of thing. Um, and then the Indonesian coffees are kind of on the opposite end of the African coffees. They tend to be much earthier. They have a lower acidity. Um, so you get words like syrupy, earthy, nutty, I almost think of it more as a savory versus a sweeter thing, kind of Indonesia and Africa. So those are the three growing regions and that's how you'll see the coffees arranged at the mill and on our shelf is by region. Um, so if you want to explore and see how coffees are different and find what you like, then that's a great way to start. Pick one from each and sample them and maybe find what you don't like as well, whatever helps you get to where you want to be. So. Um, that's the basics of where coffees come from and how their characteristics are kind of different by region. And then within each region, there's a whole lot more exploring to do. So a Colombian and a Guatemalan are gonna be different. Uh, a Kenyan and an Ethiopian are gonna be somewhat different. So there's a lot to, uh, to explore to find what you like. Um, and then kind of covered the, the, the specialty grade, what that means, um, the standards at the farm, at the roastery, um, and in the front of a coffee shop um, are hopefully high enough so that by the time you get it in your cup, it's still specialty coffee. Um, we say that it always has a potential on the plant. If the farmer's done a good job, it's specialty coffee there, but as it goes through this process from plant to cup, um, hopefully everything is maintained in a way that keeps it specialty coffee, so it keeps that high quality. Um, questions, do we have questions, Kelly? We don't have any questions yet, but I did want to just let people know that if you go to the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see an icon that says chat, and that leads you to the chat box that you're welcome to type in questions at any point in time, and we will get those to Ken as they come in. 
Okay, that's what I was. I wasn't sure if I would see them um, or if you would just uh, forward them on, so to speak. But either way, whatever works. Yeah, whenever there's a pause, if there's a question, I will definitely get that to you. Sure. Okay. Um, let's see. Beyond that, so so once we get we have a definition of specialty coffee, and you know that that quality is there in your store wherever you're buying it. Um, then we can get into different brewing methods. So when you buy that coffee and take it home, there are different ways you can brew it. So most everyone, like myself, has that ubiquitous electric coffee maker on their kitchen counter, right? So that's a drip coffee method. I use that every day myself. Um, there is a, what we refer to as a pour over, which is also a drip method, but if I had the pictures available, we could see, but I have a pour over here set up that I was going to demonstrate. And it's simply a cone, paper filter, ground coffee, pour your water through it into your cup, you have a cup of coffee. It's probably the simplest way to make a cup and, and, and you have some little bit more control over it than you do if you use that machine, right? Because the machine pretty much does what it does. This way you have a little more, a little more control over what ends up in your cup. Um, you have a Chemex maker. Some of you may have seen those. It's also a drip coffee method, but it's a glass carafe. Um, and it uses kind of a, they have a proprietary filter that um, proponents of a Chemex say it makes the cleanest cup of coffee you can get. So that filter really filters out all the excess things that maybe you don't want, more the oils and fine particulates. And so you get a real clean cup of coffee. And people that like that, so you're tasting the coffee exactly the way the farmer meant for you to, because there's nothing between it. It filters out a lot of the stuff maybe you don't want or excessive stuff. Um, a mocha pot, maybe some of you have seen a mocha pot. Uh, that's a stovetop, usually uh, aluminum stovetop type pot. And it's one where you, uh, you put your coffee, there's a metal filter basket, and then in the bottom is your water. And you put it on the stove and essentially creates a vacuum and pulls the coffee up into the top of the maker. And it makes something that is akin to espresso, a very strong coffee. Um, it's not quite an espresso, but that's one way to make a really nice strong cup of coffee if that's what you like. Um, then, of course, espresso. Some of you have probably had espresso. Um, that requires a special machine to do because uh, the coffee runs, or the water runs through the coffee, and it's literally under pressure in that, in that brew head of the machine. It squeezes the coffee, so it actually squeezes more and extracts more out of the coffee than you get just pouring water through the grounds. That's why espresso has that real thick stronger profile and you have cold brew um, a lot of you have probably heard of cold brew that's a real thing these days um, very popular we sell an awful lot at the mill um, and that's where you that's an immersion method so you put the coffee and the water together um, cold water ground coffee and you let it sit for 12 to 24 hours and it slowly extracts uh, what you want from the coffee that's how you get a cold brew and people that like that they really like that because it is a lower uh, acidity coffee. It makes a real smooth cup. So if that's what you're looking for, cold brew is a great way to go. So those are the five most common ways that people brew coffee these days. Um, like I said, everybody does drip coffee for the most part, either with a machine or with a pour over like that. Um, and we have a question. Yeah. Why can't, why do places not do cold brew decaf? Um, well, let's see. I don't know. We do. Um, there's no reason that they, that they wouldn't. The, the brewing process is the same. Um, yeah, I don't know. We've, we've done a decaf cold brew for a long time. Of course, we sell a lot more of the caffeinated. We also do a, a third one that's a chicory flavored coffee uh, that we do as a cold brew also. Seems like a lot of the big box uh, coffee specialty stores their response is always, I, we are not allowed to do decaf cold brew. So I was just curious if there was another way of doing it because of the decaf component or. No, no, okay. not, that, not that I know of. Um, it would work just the same, exactly the same as far as the brewing process. Right. It might be, my first thought is that they may not move enough of a decaf cold brew to, to have it on the menu, so to speak. That's the only thing I can think of, but you can certainly do it at home. Thank you. Any others? Okay. So let's see. I thought we'd talk a little bit about, I'm trying not to wobble my table quite so much here. <clears throat> There's not actually an earthquake happening right now, to my knowledge. So without getting, again, without getting too sciencey, 
unless you guys are interested. Um, I could talk about extraction for a long time, but we probably don't want to do that today. Um, but extraction is simply getting the stuff out of the ground coffee that you want when you put water on it. So with a cold brew, for example, that's done with the cold water. Normally we do it with hot water. Um, the hot water acts quicker uh, to break down the soluble components in the coffee. What the, the important part for, for you all to know and what I try to translate to our staff and customers is that even if you found a particular method that you like, if you only use that, that electric brewer on your kitchen countertop, um, you don't have a heck of a lot of control with that. It might have a couple of settings that you can change, you know, um, but if you do one of these manual pour overs, then you can alter things a little bit and get something different. And a lot of people have been drinking coffee for a long time, never think about that or don't realize that, that even if you're using a pour over or a French press, there are uh, variables in the extraction process that you can play around with to get something more to your liking. So um, there's generally five variables that we focus on when we talk about extraction when we're brewing coffee. The main two though, and most of you understand this, the first one is your brew method, obviously, what make, kind of maker you're using will make a different thing. Um, but then the big one is brew ratio. And all that means is the ratio of the ground coffee that you're using to the amount of liquid beverage you end up with. So in other words, you want stronger coffee, use more grounds or less water. If you want weaker coffee, use less grounds or more water. So that's all brew ratio is, but you can mess around with that and get something very different than you're used to maybe, and maybe something hopefully that you like better. Um, grind, obviously with the different brewing methods, you have a different grind. So that's one of those variables that there are standards for and you want to stick to a certain area. You don't want to get too far away from it, but for example, espresso grind is very fine, almost like a powder, um, whereas a cold brew, very coarse and chunky. Um, so you have a grind that you use depending on your method, but like say even then, you can play with the grind a little bit. If you make it finer, you'll extract more from the coffee. You'll get a richer cup. If you make the grind a little more coarse, uh, you'll extract less. You might get a little bit, not weaker cup, but a, a lighter cup, so to speak. So brew method, obviously how you're brewing it, um, the brew ratio, how much coffee you're using, and then uh, the grind are all pretty critical. Um, the others are the extraction time, so literally how long is the coffee and the water together. Um, if any of you have used a French press, you know the, that's an immersion, so the ground, the ground coffee and the water are in there together. And uh, typically, like all the makers, you'll have instructions, it'll say steep for five minutes, four to five minutes. So and a lot of times that's all people do, but you can change that a little bit if you want. Mess around with it and see if you get something you like better. So put your coffee and water in that French press, maybe only go three minutes, see how you like that. Maybe let it go six minutes, see if you like that better. So just to, that's why I try to uh, let people know that, that they can, some of these, all the brew methods have tweaks to them that you can mess around with and get something different. Was there another? There is a question, but it's specific to the mill. Okay. Somebody asked, is the mill ever going to consider a drive through location? drive through uh, That's interesting. We were just talking about, well, I won't name other names, business names, but we were talking about that model just a couple of days ago. Um, and, you know, really, I, I can't speak for the owners of the mill, uh, but I practically can because I know them pretty well at this point. But... Uh, that's just something that we haven't really considered because it's always been about the place to us. Um, the mill's always been a space. We always sell, we, we say that we sell atmosphere as much as anything else. And so we have just always thought of it as a true coffee house and not necessarily um, explored ways we could move more product, but rather how can we make the experience of the place be better? And that's what we've always focused on. So I'm not saying we wouldn't do it, um, in the right place or at the right time, but it's really nothing. It's, we've never considered it. We've always just had full type coffee house settings where people come in and gather. So, but that's just who we are. Other people do what they do and that's great. There's room for everybody. Well, you can tell the owners that you got to vote for a drive through <laughs> <laughs> I will. I'll pass it on. We're, we're always listening. Um, in fact, we just had a, we were laughing a little bit there because we have the four locations in Lincoln now. 
um, but we just uh, partnered uh, with Juice Stop in Grand Island and possibly one other uh, town in Nebraska. Um, and we were kind of laughing about it because people have been asking for years, when are you coming to Omaha? And we still haven't. <laughs> so we ended up now in Grand Island and a couple other places before we're in Omaha, which is kind of odd, but we've always been a little odd. So we like to laugh about it too, because there's never been a business plan. We've had people ask, what was your business plan or what is your business plan? We have more of one now than we used to, but there's literally never been a business plan at the mill. <laughs> it's just been about trying to treat people right and uh, do things right, and, and uh, people seem to come back. So we're happy for that. Awesome. We don't have any other questions at this point, but um, if just a reminder, if you want to use that chat box at the bottom of your screen, just click on chat, and then you will be able to ask questions that I will get to Ken. Yeah, so... Since we have some time, just I mean, if maybe we'll get some more questions, but um, I said I didn't want to go too much into the science, but just to, I guess, back up a little bit and talk about that extraction process and how you can change things for yourself, um, come up with something you like. So um, one of the biggest things, I'll use espresso as an example. I don't know if any of you have used an espresso machine, um, but there is a kind of a standard with espresso when we do training and most everyone says this, and that is that um, you should run a shot of espresso in 25 to 35 seconds. That's how long it should take. Um, if you get a little bit out of that, it's not gonna be ruined, but that's the window that you know that those variables that I talked about earlier, the extraction time, uh, the grind is right, all those things, when you get 25 to 35 seconds for that espresso shot, you know that those variables are all kind of in the right ballpark. Um, so you know it's gonna turn out pretty well. And I should also say that we always make a point of saying that um, if you have good coffee and good water and decent equipment, you're going to get a pretty good result. It's really not hard. It's, it's harder to mess it up than not. Um, if you're really into it and you really want to geek out on it and uh, play with these variables like I'm talking about and do more experimentation, you can push the quality, you can push it up a little bit higher. You're going to get a great cup of coffee. Um, but you know, a lot of us, I get up at 5 or 5.30 in the morning and I have a five-year-old daughter and I don't care necessarily if I'm getting the greatest cup of coffee ever made on a Wednesday morning at home. It's going to be good because I know the coffee's good and it's fresh and the water's good and I'm halfway paying attention to what I'm doing. It's going to be just fine. So that's kind of our other thing, kind of philosophically. Um, there's lots of ways to do this stuff. Um, you know, a barista may tell you at your local shop that they have elevated this shot of espresso to heretofore unknown levels of greatness because of their skills. Not really. <laughs> they probably hopefully have good coffee. They're paying attention. They know how to use the equipment. It's going to be pretty consistently good. Um, and I say that as a roaster. Um, any roaster worth their salt should say that our job is to not ruin it. The, the farmers have done all the hard work. That being on that plant is as good as it's going to get, like I mentioned earlier. So when I get my hands on it, I try to maintain that. I try not to mess it up. Um, and then when I hand it off to our baristas, I tell them, don't mess it up. Just pay attention, care about it, and it's going to be good. So, Follow-up just... questions actually to your water. A um, couple people have asked, should they be using distilled or tapped or filtered? What makes a better brew? That's a good question. It's a pretty common question. Um, we say here in Lincoln, uh, we don't necessarily recommend you do anything. The tap water is, is good here. It's considered good. Um, if you're using an espresso machine, then absolutely a filtered water because the minerals in your tap water going through the espresso machine are usually what break it. Um, they build up in there and that's causes most of your problems with espresso machines. Um, now, uh, I've been in places where, well, so I used to visit uh, Tulsa regularly, my family there, and uh, their tap water smells like a swimming pool. Um, so if I live there, I would be filtering that water for sure for my coffee, because that's, you're going to notice that it's going to degrade the coffee. Um, distilled water is usually not recommended. I don't know a lot about the science of it, but basically distilled water has no mineral content, and generally coffee people agree that some minerals in the cup are good, make the coffee better. So you don't want to take everything out of that water. So that's generally what we what we say to people. Use your tap water. If it's good, it's fine. If it's not right. so good, filter it. 
couple of questions have come in. So what components should I look for in a basic brewing machine? Okay, um, if we're talking about, oh, and that was one of the questions that you had sent me by email with someone who was shopping maybe for a, a, a brewer possibly with a milk frothing uh, capability on it. Um, and I, I had to admit to uh, Kelly that I didn't know a lot about, I didn't have much advice on, because we actually don't sell any of the brewing, uh, electrical uh, brewing products at the mill anymore. We used to sell espresso machines and a couple of electric brewers, but we just got out of that business a while ago because, well, Amazon. Um, <laughs> but um, the main advice that I would have, especially if you're looking for an espresso machine, is you want to spend, if you're going to an espresso machine, you want to spend at least 350 to $400. And that even sounds like a lot of money to people, but it's not relative to what a commercial espresso machine costs. They're not, they're not cheap. Um, but the reason for that is that um, at that price point, you know you're getting a pump in that machine that's gonna work, it's gonna create the pressure it needs, and also it's gonna last. A lot of the machines under that price point, you're gonna be throwing them away next year and getting another one. So, um, but as far as general brewers, my thoughts are, um, like the, the, the countertop electric coffee maker, um, I'll admit right now that I have, I believe the one we have at home now cost about 49 bucks, and it makes a fine cup of coffee. Um, so you don't have to spend a lot. Um, the quality overall uh, through the price range of electric coffee makers these days is much better again than it used to be. Um, I had a machine at one point that I think I got for $24 and it lasted five years and it was consistent and it was fine. So um, mostly it's just features, find what you want. I really appreciate that we can set ours up at night and it's brewed in the morning when I get up. So if a timer like that, you know, is something you want, then I mean, that's the main thing is find the features that you want, but yeah. Actually, follow up for that, um, kind of a two-parter. Somebody asked, how do I store my coffee? And then what, kind of going along with that, what effects does it have for the preset? So you put your coffee in the filter the night before, and then it's brewing in the morning. Like, does that change any of the components of a good cup of coffee? Right, it does. Um, and that's, I guess I've just made another confession because, um, so, Another recommendation we make, uh, not to, I'll get to that, it's a question for sure, uh, but we advise people to buy coffee just like they do produce. Um, so you don't buy a month's worth of broccoli, right? So try and buy a week's worth of coffee. Um, that's gonna make sure that it's, it's fresh by the time you're using it. Um, so uh, every coffee, especially coffee person, will tell you to grind your coffee as you brew it, right? So you grind it immediately before you brew it. That will make sure that it's fresher. Once you grind coffee, it begins de to degrade pretty quickly. Um, the aromatics are, are very uh, volatile, so they start leaving in a hurry, and the coffee stales fairly quickly. That said, uh, I buy really fresh coffee because I just roasted it. I'll grind it at the store and take it home. So I'm not doing what I, <laughs> what I should be doing as a specialty coffee person, but it's still very fresh, and I keep it airtight. And by the time I use it, which is really usually just three to four days, it's still making a very good cup of coffee. Now, on Sunday morning, I may get my Chemex out and grind it fresh and do everything, you know, very carefully, and, 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 and it is going to be a little bit better experience. Um, but, so storage, airtight is critical or important, um, just something like a Tupperware. Um, if you keep it in there, and especially if you keep it whole bean until you use it, you're going to get the best, uh, the highest level uh, of quality there. Um, airtight and uh, away from any moisture. And that's why we don't recommend people put it in the fridge or freezer, um, especially if it's ground, because for one, it's a very good attractor or absorber of other odors. So if it's not airtight and it's in your fridge or freezer, it's gonna start to taste like whatever else is in there. Um, but the other part is you take it out to make your coffee in the morning and it's cold coming out of the fridge or freezer, and then you forget it and leave it out. Then you're, then you're having some condensation happen in there and that's not great for it either. So mainly keep moisture and air away from it, buy it a, week's, a, a week at a time, a week's worth at a time, and you're gonna have good coffee. Pretty hard to mess up. I'm learning so much, thank you. Um, some other questions coming in is what is, um, is there much difference between store purchase brands and how can you tell the difference between them? Oh, I'm sorry, what was the? Is there a difference between the coffee in the store, different brands, or how can you tell a quality? Right, so 
I mentioned it earlier. Um, store coffee, grocery store coffee, um, used to take a lot of heat from specialty coffee people like us. And true, 10 and especially 20 years ago, grocery store coffee was just not fresh. We didn't have the supply chain that we do now. It moved much slower. By the time you bought it off the grocery store shelf, it was probably a month or two old, and it's probably already ground. So, but that's changed a lot. Um, so you do get perfectly decent coffee in the grocery store. Um, brand to brand, um, you know, it's interesting because prices are, well, it, it is a commodity, as you guys probably know, and there's a lot of things that affect commodity pricing and then end up eventually, you know, our pricing, the consumer. Um, I would say, and there are so many brands now that, you know, I, I buy coffee from the store sometimes just to just to see what's out there. I'll buy Dunkin' Donuts. You know, uh, I don't always remember to take coffee home on Friday and we're, we're going to run out on the weekend. I'll buy grocery store coffee um, if I have to and also just to, try to see what's out there. Um, I don't know that there's uh, a, a, a large, the biggest difference you're going to get um, with store brand coffees is that they use a lot of, there are two basic species of coffee. Here I go with the science again. Um, so most of what we buy, what you'll buy in a specialty coffee place is Arabica. You guys have probably heard that. 100% Arabica, that's what they always advertise. That's the good stuff. Um, the other bean that, that we use in this business is a Robusta or a Robusta bean. And it is, uh, you can get good quality Robusta beans, but you don't want to drink them by themselves because they are higher in caffeine and caffeine is, is bitter. Um, it's a pest deterrent in the plant. So that makes bugs not want to eat the coffee plant so much. So the caffeine that we're all kind of after is also uh, by itself very bitter and unpleasant. So grocery store coffee uh, uses a lot of that Robusta, but they mix it into blends to make it a little more palatable, um, but it's also much cheaper. So that's generally why specialty coffee versus your store brands, that's the big difference between them is simply the quality of that bean. Um, and just the aroma and taste profiles are just at different levels. Um, but, you know, having said that, um, I used to, uh, when I'd visit my mother uh, in Tulsa, I'd take uh, milk coffee down with me and she'd always try it and she'd say, oh, that's fine. And then she'd go back to her Cane's, you know, her grocery store coffee, because that's what she was used to. And that's the, the, the flavor that she was, that she liked. And that's fine. So I finally gave up on uh, converting her to specialty coffee. She wasn't going to change. So Awesome. Um, when you're using, sorry, I read this question wrong. What about the water temperature for a drip maker? Oh, oh sure. Um, water temperature. So if, you, if you're using an automatic drip maker, then obviously the machine controls that for you. If it's working properly, it's going to be the right temperature. Um, we say for brewing, um, and this is pretty standard also, uh, 195 to 205 degrees is ideal. Um, so then obviously if you're using a manual pour over, like I've shown you earlier, um, you're going to have to make sure your, your water's in that, in that range, right? And again, if, you, if you're outside that range a little bit, is it going to be ruined? No. If you're way outside of it, it's not going to go well because if you're at 170 degrees, uh, it simply will not extract things from the coffee that you want that tastes good. Um, it, it's not hot enough to break down those solubles. If you're way over 205, say boiling, um, you will extract more of the bitter compounds in, in the, it's actually the plant fibers in the coffee will come out and end up in your cup and those are real bitter. So that's why that range 195 to 205 is, is good. Um, that's where you want to be generally. But so that automatic maker will do that for you. But if you're doing a more manual thing, um, you'll have to you know, make sure. What I usually do, I have a water kettle. So that thing will come to a boil and then I'll just take it off, and open the top while I'm putting my grounds in the filter. I don't take a thermometer out. I know if I wait about 30 seconds, it's going to be about 190, 195. So that's the main thing. How do I care for my French press? How do you clean it? How do you care? Oh, sure. Um, that's important because it's got a few parts in there, right? So you have the carafe itself um, that holds the coffee and water. And then you have the uh, plunger part of the apparatus. And most of those, uh, you unscrew the, the part that acts as the filter, which is literally just kind of a fine metal or mesh screen. And then there's a piece that, that holds that in place. So you need to take all that apart, um, which is a little more work, obviously. I really like a French press coffee too. So um, I usually just even loosen that up, 
So we put it in the top rack of the dishwasher. Otherwise, uh, there's oils and probably some grounds that get trapped in that part of the apparatus that don't come out. And then if you keep using that, um, those oils are vegetable oils, essentially, and they're, they're in coffee, and the coffee's a vegetable uh, or a plant, so uh, they go rancid. So any kind of coffee equipment, if you're not cleaning it pretty well regularly, those oils are going to start to get funky, and you're going to see that you're going to taste that, and it's not great. So just pull it apart, give it a, I, they say actually most French presses say to hand wash, um, but again, here's another compromise that I make. I mean, I'll put that top part in the dishwasher, and it's fine. Uh, you know, the finish might not last quite as long or something, but um, I'm lazy sometimes. Do you have a favorite travel mug that you feel like keeps the integrity of your coffee? Travel mugs? Um, well, there's so many good ones now. I mean, as long as it's airtight and especially, you know, you have the double walled um, type of stainless steel, that's going to keep it hot forever. And that's the main thing. If it's airtight, um, it's not degrading. Um, kind of like if you... If you have a carafe of coffee um, and it's sitting on that burner, like you would see maybe in a diner or whatever back in the, you know, um, that coffee sitting there, it's degrading pretty heavily over time. It's sitting there for three or four hours, um, it's getting stronger and stronger and the heat applied to it is not good for it. So any travel mug, especially a double walled mug, um, is going to keep it great. Probably, I mean, we sell some that I think keep it hot for eight or 10 hours. Um, so. That really is a great way to, even if you're not um, traveling necessarily, you don't need a sealed container necessarily, it's still a great way to keep the cup good for a long time. So you can drink it over a long period and it's, and it's still as it was when you brewed it, basically. Very good. Is there anybody else that has a question? You could feel free to even unmute your mic and you're welcome to ask the question. I think, oh, we just had somebody come through. Um, somebody said, I love coffee, especially cold brew, but in the summer, I'm a huge fan of iced tea. Please provide the feedback that customers would love a larger iced tea option. I know you guys do iced tea there. Um, do you guys brew it a certain way or anything like that at the mill? And then do you have suggestions? Yeah, there, I mean, there's, uh, there's sort of the same guidelines for brewing iced tea. Um, one question we get a lot, if it's, uh, especially with black tea, um, why is it cloudy? Uh, and or bitter. Um, so the best thing you can do when you're brewing tea and what we do in the store is we brew it um, and we leave it or we let it cool uh, essentially to room temperature before we put it in the fridge or put ice in it because and I wish I should know the words I wish I could remember the uh, the chemicals that are in the tea um, basically when you shock it with cold too quickly or you try to cool it too quickly um, it changes it and that's where you get bitter and cloudy so if you want a nice, clear, uh, smooth tea, let it cool after you brew it. Um, or you can do the old sun tea thing. Some people, uh, they stopped recommending that because of setting the jar out in the patio like I used to do. And then people are afraid of health issues with, you know, mold or whatever. But, um, you know, you can, you can brew it essentially like cold brew coffee too. You can put leaves in the cold water and just let it sit for, you know, eight hours. And that works pretty well too. Depending on the tea, that's a little more tricky, but... You know, larger iced tea size, that was the, uh, I'll note that. We have had that over the years. People do, uh, you know, we generally, all our drinks are either 12 or 16 ounces. And we do have people say, can you get a 24 ounce or a 30, you know, and the owners have just, just resisted that for so, I don't know. It's, you know, part of it is just logistics on our side, having five different cup sizes. Um, but part of it is sort of this idea of portioning. Like we kind of try to stick as much to traditional espresso drinks as we can. But even we, you know, it, in our country, people want more milk. So the lattes have gotten bigger and bigger. Um, but there's no reason we shouldn't do a larger iced tea. So I'll pass that on. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions on here, but I have a question for you. Okay. Because you are the coffee man. If you had to go with one type of brewing mechanism, what would you personally choose? What is your favorite way to brew a cup of coffee? Okay, so sorry, I'm actually trying to make this pour over right now. No. Um, <laughs> um, so I tell people, uh, I have all of these methods at home. I don't always get to use them as much as I'd like, but 
I do pour over, I do Chemex. It depends on what mood I'm in, and I'm that way about coffee generally. If people say, what's your favorite coffee? It's really hard for me to answer that, and I'm not just trying to skip around it. Um, sometimes I like that fruity, tangy African, uh, but usually not in the morning. Usually I want a Latin American in the morning because they're easier to drink. Um, so I truly do like all of them, and I like all the brewing methods. It just depends on what mood I'm in because they all do different things. Um, if I had to pick one, it would be the manual pour over. Um, partly I think I like it just because it is probably the least expensive way to make a great cup of coffee. You need a $5 plastic cone and some filters. Um, so anyone can afford to do that. And like I said earlier, you get a little more control than you do over your electric brewer. So I like that. Um, you can play with the temperature a little bit. You can play with the extraction time a little bit. Nerd out with it. Um, get exactly what you like. Um, so I'd pick I'd pick a manual pour over if I had to pick one, and probably second would be Chemex, which is funny because um, ten years ago I would have said French press is my favorite method. Um, that makes a real thick cup of coffee, right? A real uh, real heavier, thicker brew, um, and I've almost done a 180 now, where I like that lighter, cleaner Chemex better for some reason. You know, tastes change over the years, I guess. So, and that's all right too. Any other? I, we have not had any other questions come in, but these have been great. Kelly, do you have anything else? You're muted again, Kelly. Kelly, you're muted. How about now? Is that better? Okay. So, I gave a confession that nobody heard. The French press question was mine, but I did it incognito. I broke one in the dishwasher once. And so I didn't want to break my new one. I had to ask you how to care for it. Right. My question, as both a coffee and a chocolate lover, is I want some examples, Ken, of great coffee and chocolate pairings, if you can. Sure. Well, they, they do go together pretty well. Um, and there's a lot of, uh, well, as some of you might know, we make our own chocolate at the mill now as well. So I'm always uh, willing to experiment on that side of things, uh, chocolate samples and coffee. Um, I really don't, it's hard to go wrong. I think it's, it's mainly, um, you know, a lot of the darker chocolates, the real high cacao chocolates are, very much remind me of espresso or a real strong coffee. They have almost that mm -hmm. uh, sour, bitter in a good way sort of thing. So um, if I had to say like generally, um, I'm always gonna do dark chocolates or darker chocolates with coffee. That's a good starting point. I like milk chocolate too. Um, but, and I guess on that in, that, in that way, you could do milk chocolate with uh, maybe a darker roast coffee if you like dark roast coffees um, or African coffees in particular. Uh, have a lot in common with chocolate. A lot of the uh, fruity, especially in the darker ones, um, they're very similar. A lot of the same flavor components, I think. So um, pairings, I mean, I guess that, that would be my, my main thought is darker. Uh, I, would go, I would go with darker chocolates, just generally with coffee. But I mean, it's all good, right? You can't go wrong. It is all good. And on the days that you're not rushing around trying to get your daughter ready and get to work, when you're really going to enjoy that cup of coffee, whatever the method, what do you like to have with your cup of coffee? Oh, okay. So that's a good question. That's not something that people usually ask. Um, I guess as a coffee person, well, one of the things we talk a lot about is tasting. So we do tastings in our, in our roastery. And when we do that, we're tasting mainly to, uh, so I'll take one coffee, one particular coffee, say a Colombian maybe that we haven't had before, and I'll roast that four or five different ways. Um, and we can get into a whole nother discussion about roast profiles and whatnot, but um, and then we'll sit and taste those. And what we're trying to do there, we already know we have great coffee because our suppliers are good at their jobs. So we're trying to figure out what our customers, what we think our customers will like the best for that particular coffee. So that's called profile roasting. So that's a fairly new thing in coffee. Um, but sorry, I forgot the original. <laughs> we were talking about different. Um, sorry, go ahead. What What do you like to? What do you enjoy with oh, your coffee? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, 
So when we talk, when I'm thinking about tasting coffee and really uh, when we're doing that, or when I'm doing a public tasting, because I do that sometimes for groups, um, just for fun. Um, what I talk about with new hires is the idea of tasting uh, purposefully. Uh, so you're tasting the coffee and you're really paying attention to what you're tasting. Um, and it's difficult at first if you haven't done it very much. The good thing is the more you do it, the better you get at it. And you, may, you can find a thing called a taster's flavor wheel. And it's basically a diagram of all kinds of words and some of them not necessarily positive, but things you can taste in coffee. And it gives you kind of a starting point to get better at it. So you start to build a library of, of words that go with these things you're tasting and smelling. And so to get to the question, um, when I'm doing that, when I'm really enjoying the coffee, I don't want anything else with it. Um, I really want to taste it, really appreciate it by itself. Um, the other side of that is uh, I like anything with coffee, really. So um, <laughs> maybe chocolate. That's a good one. Um, yeah. That's fine. Chocolate, uh, you know, the, the classic stuff. I mean, pastries and coffee, uh, lots of things that go together. You could start thinking about you know, literally a fruit Danish. We have a new Danish that we started making in our kitchen at the mill. Um, it's kind of a classic. Uh, I, had, I had it for the first time the other day, actually. Uh, cherries, fresh cherry filling. Um, you can start thinking about coffee. Oh, yeah. so start thinking that immediately makes me think African coffees. They're very fruity. So that's the fun part. When you start exploring for yourself uh, based on what you like, and then pairings just sort of start to come to mind naturally, especially once you get better identified Delicious. flavors. Yeah. Do you, you mentioned the tastings. Do you ever have them open to the public or are they private events? That is something that we are constantly talking about that we want to do. Um, in our warehouse in the Haymarket, we used to have our kitchen in the warehouse on the ground floor. We um, About six months ago, we moved the kitchen to the basement. Um, and so we have some space in the warehouse right now that we were intending to turn into exactly that, um, a tasting area or a tasting room sort of scenario. Um, where we could do public events or just for our own use. Um, so that's definitely a work in progress that we're, that we're wanting to do. Um, but otherwise, right here in the bistro where I am today, this is where I've done several for private groups that were interested that just contacted us and said, hey, we want to learn about coffee um, or do, do a tasting. Um, so definitely something we want to do more of. Of course, things have gotten weird recently. So uh, not something we can do, but we're excited about doing more of that public stuff. Yeah, that sounds awesome. All right. Well, Kelly, do you want to close us out here? Yeah, let's do. If no one else has any other questions for Ken, Ken, you were amazing. That went so fast. Thank oh. you so much for for joining us and and walking us through the wide world of coffee. Um, I know that, that Ken teaches in other capacities and maybe give him a Google to see what else is he has going on if you want to um, to learn more from him. I'd like to thank Caitlin again for making my job so easy. Um, I was mostly decorative at this point and I didn't do that very well, so don't look at that little square. Um, if you are interested in our series, I, this was the very first, we're every Tuesday at 2 in the month of September. Next week, um, Megan McGuffey from Community Crop is going to, um, to join us talking about how to make the most of your local harvest. What that means is we all planted these huge gardens or our neighbors are giving us produce. We're going to the farmer's market. Think beyond banana bread is <laughs> what we're encouraging you to do. And um, Caitlin just posted the link to next week. We have some great stuff going on. I thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate all of you and hope you have a fantastic day. Thanks. Yeah, thank you all. I appreciate it. I'm glad to do it.